And I want to thank the participants in this discussion for their cooperation throughout the planning of this program. I am hopeful that the in intellectual tone uh, can prevail, which was the original intent of this program, even with the increased audience and coverage. At this time, I would like to introduce to you the moderator for the discussion from the Department of Speech here at the University, Professor George Shapiro. Thank you, David. Thank you. This afternoon, we're going to hear a discussion on the nature and limits of academic freedom. Therefore, I think it would be appropriate to read for you part of a statement issued by the Board of Regents of this university on December 14, 1963. Quote, it cannot be too strongly stated that the only atmosphere in which a university can fulfill its assigned role is the atmosphere of freedom. Nor is it surprising that in America, where free discussion is the first principle of our political faith, universities have flourished best and have at the same time made the most remarkable contribution to the public good. From the first days of our independence, the giants of American history have revered the principle of free speech. They have recognized that any effort to close by force a free discussion is destructive of the dictator and the dictated too. The first is poisoned by power. The latter is denied a share in the public dialogue. The man denied participation in free discussion loses, at the very least, his participating right as a citizen. But he may also be robbed of the dignity and self-respect which freedom encourages. A university equally cherishes responsibility, the natural corollary of freedom. It is in this belief that the Union Board of Governors, West Bank Noon Programs Committee, presents this discussion on the topic, what should be the nature and limits of academic freedom. Each speaker this afternoon will have 15 minutes. I have a little clock here. The bell will ring when 15 minutes are up, and we've told the speakers that they may have one or two more sentences at that, after that time. Uh, after the speakers finish, I will pull questions from the box and read them. Uh, the reason we're doing it this way is to guarantee each person here an equal opportunity to ask the speakers a question. So uh, the ushers will pass amongst you with boxes, and you may place your questions in the box, and we shake them all up, and I pull one out, and we'll read it. Uh, each speaker may respond to the question, and we're asking that the speakers limit their responses to about no more than two minutes, certainly. Our first speaker on the topic, what should be the nature and limits of academic freedom, has been a member of the Twin City business community for 50 years. He's been a member of the St. Paul City Council for 28 years. He is presently Commissioner of Public Works. It's my pleasure to present to you this afternoon, Commissioner Milton Rosen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. On the morning of December the 5th, 1963, my wife and I were having breakfast when we read in the St. Paul Pioneer Press the statements attributed to Professor Sibley in which he stated, personally, I, would, I should like to see on the campus of the University of Minnesota one or two communist professors, a student communist club, a chapter of the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism, a society for the, for the promotion of free love, a league for the overthrow of our government by Jeffersonian violence, <laughs> an anti-automation league, and perhaps a nudist club. No university should be without individuals and groups like these, so he said. If we don't sow seeds of doubt and implant subversive thoughts in college, when and where in heaven's name, and in parentheses, if there is a heaven, will they be implanted? And if they are never sown, moral and intellectual progress may be even more doubtful 
than any, uh, than any of us think. We were stunned as well as shocked to hear this statement attributed to this professor. Now let's take this statement. Do we need communist professors paid for out of our tax funds to become professors at the University of Minnesota? I hope not. Then he recommends a student communist club, and as I understand the laws of the United States of America, this would be unconstitutional. Communist cells are not permitted. Then he wants a chapter of the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism. This statement is an insult to every God-fearing person in our nation and should be never tolerated in a university whose very existence is made possible by the tax monies you and I pay. He wants, he wants a society for the promotion of free love. Well, I don't know anything about this. I'm too old. <laughs> I will say this, <laughs> that the body houses in St. Paul, Minnesota, and throughout the state have been closed, and institutions of free love are not permissive. Then he wants a league for the overthrow of government by Jeffersonian violence. I would like to have the professor enlarge on this statement. I don't understand it. <laughs> and I think it's subject to an investigation by authorities higher up. <laughs> now, of course, he recommends an anti-automation league. He'll get nowhere because you can't stop progress. And what he would want with a nudist club around the University of Minnesota can only be the thought of a, of a depraved mind. <laughs> and, I, and I don't think any decent, God-fearing person would recommend a thought of this kind. I have a letter on the University of Minnesota stationery in which Professor Sibley says, I do not believe in any divinity of Christ. I do not believe in the virgin birth. I should not call myself a Christian as I understand the orthodox meaning of that term. Well, he has a right to his belief in any thought of religion he may have. That's his right. But I would like to ask Professor Sibley if he considers himself a Christian, no matter how he stands on the orthodox meaning of that term. I would like to ask Professor Sibley if it is true that he was not given a permanent faculty appointment at the University of Stanford due to protests he made about the Pacific H-bomb and their tests and who his leftist thoughts. In the annual report, given out by the FBI, Director J. Edgar Hoover recently stated, there's a plot in the American Communist Party to exploit what he termed a, a drift toward the left by the nation's youth. I have no doubt in my mind that the thoughts of J. Edgar Hoover are correct. Now, notwithstanding the fact that, that Mr. Sibley has been on the stage and spoken in the same tone as Gus Hall, the General Secretary of the Communist Party, of the United States of America, I can only say that birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> Lee Harvey Oswald, the young man who killed the President of the United States, was a freedom marcher, and he was a socialist, which seems to be the password for some of these pinks. It was unfortunate that the United States government sent him money to come back to this country after he renounced his citizenship. I would like to know just where does the intellectual honesty begin and just where does deceit come in. I honestly believe in academic freedom, but we must, we, but we need academic responsibility also. The University of Minnesota has had one of the finest reputations throughout the nation for its efficiency in putting young men and women through our university. And it should be continued. <laughs> and it should be continued as a God-fearing institution of learning. It should not be, be sponsored by filth 
such as is contained in the statements of Mulford Q. Sibley, who travels around the United States not as Mulford Q. Sibley, but as a professor of the University of, the, of Minnesota. I would like to have Professor Sibley explain to you people what is wrong with the Smith Act in which he urges clemency. I would also like to know what is wrong with the McCarran Act. His statement should be given to the public press rather than to the Daily Worker, the official Communist Party paper. He is quoted regularly in this Communist newspaper as one of its sympathizers. In the Daily Worker of March 15, 1957, they indicate that Professor Sibley of the Socialist Party was a participant in a forum held in Chicago, Illinois, March 27, 1957, on the subject of relationship of socialism and democracy, held under the joint sponsorship of the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, and the Independent Socialist League, a Trotskyite organization. In this article, Professor Sibley is, identif is identified as a professor of political science of the University of Minnesota. I would like Professor Sibley to make a public statement does he believe in communism and the Communist Party? And does he sanction their existence? I think the public has a right to have an answer to this question. The Communists and the Trotskyites are active in the fair play for Cuba, and this is another Communist-led opposition to our government. Professor Sibley has made the statement publicly that he is a socialist, a pacifist, and an anarchist. I would like to have him tell this audience and the public what he means by this statement. I have never had any respect for self-anointed anarchists and their danger to our nation needs no explanation by me. I wish I had more time to delve into the activities of Professor Sibley, which seem to have the approval of our Lieutenant Governor Sandy Keith, the Governor of the State of Minnesota, Mr. Rolvog, plus the... Plus the Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota, and no doubt, President. I think we have a right to know who supports this man's contention. Some basic truths tie our society together. They are the anchors that save us from anarchy. This is the central fact to remember in this controversy over the academic freedom of the, United, of the University of Minnesota. It was one of the important points, actually, which the regents stressed in their weekend statement on the, on the matter. And if anybody understands their statement, I'd like to know who it is. I didn't. <laughs> that the regents, along with academic freedom, goes responsibility. I have no objection to free speech, and I have no objection to freedom of thought academic freedom. I speak out every day of the week in the city council, <laughs> in the city council of the city of St. Paul. I have to make decisions right and wrong. I make mistakes, I admit that. I believe in academic freedom, providing there is an academic responsibility to the people of the United States. I can only say this, and I trust I have the time. I have been in business in the city of St. Paul for close on to 50 years. I have never failed to pay my just bills or indebtedness. I have never had a fire in my place of business, and I've never had a failure. I have served the people of St. Paul for approximately 30 years as one of its commissioners. Someone has made the statement that I've brought this little subject up to have it a sort of a political football to help me in the coming election, which takes place in April. <laughs> well, I might as well tell you young people who are students at the University of Minnesota, there's nothing finer for you to study than politics than to become a politician in your particular city. I have deemed it an honor and a pleasure to serve my people. And I have tried my best to do things that I thought were right in my heart. I don't like deceit and I don't like distrustful people. I don't like people who will try to bring out filth in place of God-fearing thoughts in the minds of you young men and women here today. 
Now, whether you agree with me or not, that's your prerogative. I'm not going to try to sway any of you. But I'm going to tell you this. I believe in what I've said today. I believe in what I've tried to tell you people is honesty. And if honesty doesn't go along with your trend of thought, then God help you people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosen. Our next speaker has been a visiting professor at Stanford University and Cornell University. He was a member of a consulting team invited by Northwestern University to reassess the field of political science in America today. He has been a visiting professor at Pendle Hill, the Adult Education Center for the Quaker Society of Friends. Professor Mulford Q. Sibley, University of Minnesota Political Science Department. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Rosen, and friends. Uh, many of the questions that Commissioner Rosen put in his talk, it seems to me, are irrelevant to the issue, which is the nature of academic freedom. However, uh, however, despite the fact that many of them are irrelevant, I'll answer one and will be willing to answer others in the course of the question period if you are interested, despite the fact that they get off the subject. He asked whether I am a member of the Communist Party. No. And moreover, I'll go further than that. I'll say that I'm opposed to the overthrow of any government by force and violence. Now, I hope that's clear enough. I now proceed to the talk. I make five points. First, there is a truth to be discovered. We cannot prove in the ordinary sense of the term that there is a truth to be discovered. But most of us accept the proposition in one way or another. Some, like Gandhi, even equate truth with God and the never-ending pursuit of truth with the pursuit of God. That's my first point. The second point, that it is important and distinctively human for men to pursue the truth. That it is important and distinctively human for men to pursue the truth rests upon the assertion that since humanity is in a peculiar sense possessed of rationality and reason in the broad sense of the term is closely associated with the truth-seeking process, man is not truly man unless he is making some effort to pursue the truth. This is true not only of academic men, but of men in general. They're most distinctively human when they're trying to pursue the truth. Three. My third proposition, that we don't know the contents of truth and hence need a near absolute freedom to pursue it in a diversity of ways. That we have only a partial and very minor knowledge of the contents of truth in any realm is a proposition which some may challenge, but only at the cost of making themselves look foolish. But if we don't know the truth, if we don't know the truth, and if it, is, if it is important that we search for it, then any limitation on our pursuit of it, any restriction on our freedom of discussion, any restrictions on our freedom of discussion are in effect attempting what is virtually a suppression of our humanity. Angels presumably don't need this freedom, and non-human animals couldn't make use of it even if they had it, but human beings need it. Even if we assume a perfect knowledge of the truth, which I've denied, absolute freedom of inquiry and expression are still essential. For as John Stuart Mill pointed out a century ago, we really understand our own version of the so-called truth when we are challenged by an opposition. This challenge forces us to reconsider our premises and to take a fresh look at our experience of the world. Thus, if we contend, for example, that Christianity has the whole truth about religion, even if we assume this, 
This truth is apt to remain merely formal or to disappear in a mass of words if the Christian is not forced to come to grips with an anti-Christian criticism. From this point of view, the true Christian should welcome the challenge of dedicated atheists. The capitalist should welcome the criticisms of intelligent and dedicated Marxists. And the communist should welcome the attacks of capitalists. And if opposite, uh, uh, opponents don't exist, if opponents don't exist, we should invent them, paraphrasing Voltaire. Four, that the central function of academic institutions is to pursue the truth and encourage a near absolute freedom to do so. While all men as men have as one of their central missions the pursuit of truth, their academic institutions are in a peculiar sense designed for this end. All men, to the extent that they are truly human, have an itch to discover truth. But the academic man, uh, man uh, to, but academic men make its pursuit central to their adult lives. Hence, all the observations about absolute freedom of expression and investigation which we apply to mankind as a whole are emphatically and doubly applicable to academic men and students. This means that subject only to his not directly provoking a riot and to the general laws of libel and slander, the professor should not be subject to economic or other penalizations by university administrations or the community for what he says or writes. Obviously, of course, the professor must be open to criticism either in the form of speaking or writing. Robert McEver has well expressed the value of academic freedom in these words. Quote, unless we appreciate the value of the primary function of that distinctively and in a sense unique, uh, that distinctively and in a sense uniquely characterizes the university and refuse to let it be jeopardized by the conformist demands of special groups, then the community will suffer two grievous losses. It will lose the light of intellectual freedom that shines from the untrammeled university, and it will lose the great contributions that the free university can bestow. The example of open-minded inquiry, the substitution of reason for passion in the treatment of controversial issues in the spirit of fair play. End of the quote. The risk that goes with this freedom is, of course, that academic men may say foolish things or make statements that appear outrageous to the bulk of mankind. But no freedom is without risk, and many of the propositions that appear foolish or outrageous today may in the future seem less so. At any rate, we can't have our cake and eat it too. We either believe in freedom with any possible embarrassments as well as gains, or we don't believe in freedom. There's no middle way. During the recent controversy, <laughs> during the... During the recent uh, controversy, a number of issues arose that might be discussed briefly at this point. A, the problem of responsibility. B, the allegedly peculiar nature of an institution deriving much of its income from taxation. C, the pursuit of truth where emotions are involved, morality and politics. And D, the alleged emotional and intellectual immaturity of students. A. Much has been said during the recent affair about the proposition that responsibility must accompany freedom. Responsibility is, to be sure, the other side of the coin of freedom. Presumably, the academic claiming freedom of expression, investigation, and exchange of experiences must keep in mind his responsibility to his own sense of truth, to the academic profession as a whole, and to humanity. But sometimes the term responsibility has rather dubious connotations. It seems, when used by some, to imply that the university or the public has the right to penalize the academic, whether student or teacher, for what he says or writes. If the student or teacher gets, quote, too far out of line, out of line being defined by some vague public or some college authority, he may be dismissed or officially censured, according to this line of reasoning. Thus, Professor Leo Koch at the University of Illinois was recently dismissed from his position, a clear violation of contract, solely because of a single letter which he wrote to the university newspaper. The argument of the university administration at Illinois was that the contents of his letter demonstrated, quote, irresponsibility in advocating generally unacceptable views about sex relations between students. 
In my view, the University of Illinois committed an outrageous act in the Koch case, and I think the University of Illinois administration was rightly censured by the American Association of University Professors. In general, the academic himself should be the judge of whether what he says is said responsibly. Of course, the principle of freedom guarantees the right of others to criticize him for what he for what they may think is his irresponsibility. But if other forms of sanctions are imposed other than counter-criticism, freedom itself is destroyed. And the parallel with the press, I think, is a good one. Uh, the press can be criticized for acting irresponsibly, but it cannot be subject to government censorship or suppressed for what it says or doesn't say. B, some of the critics have, continued, uh, have contended that a tax-supported institution is in a peculiar position the argument, as I understand it, is that while academic freedom is a correct principle, tax-supported facilities should not provide a forum for those who differ with predominant views. Presumably unorthodox views are more appropriately stated in private institutions, but this argument cannot stand. To say that certain types of advocacy should not be allowed in tax-supported institutions is to say that the very purpose of an educational organization is, betrayed, is to be betrayed. It assumes that the preponderant views held by the taxpayers are truth, certainly an astonishing proposition. <laughs> even if be, even if be, even if it, even if it be assumed that the major attitudes of the taxpaying public are true, we still should permit, yes, even encourage contrary positions on the campus if we accept the proposition advanced earlier that those who have the truth need critics to keep it alive for them. But we must go even further and say the tax-supported institutions, above all others, should tolerate and encourage a wide variety of viewpoints. After all, a private institution sponsored, let us say, by a religious organization may tend to stress a given world outlook, but a tax-supported institution is sustained by thousands of human beings who vary quite widely in their views of the world. Above all others, a tax-supported institution should be pluralistic. It goes without saying, of course, that I'm not advocating that classes be turned into schools of propaganda. The teacher will not be a propagandist in his classroom. But the campus as a whole should welcome all kinds of propaganda and discussion groups, from those which challenge the status quo at all points to those which support it on every score, from the atheist to the God-fearing, from the advocates of free love to strict exponents of celibacy, from leagues to overthrow all governments by force and violence to leagues opposing overthrow of any government, including the Russian and the Chinese, by force and violence. Henry Cadbury, a leading student of the Bible at Harvard, puts all this nicely when he quotes an American bishop as saying, if I could make everyone think alike, it would be the same as no one thinking at all. End of quote from the bishop. See. Sometimes, <laughs> see, sometimes defenders of academic freedom appear to imply that it is primarily designed to secure a wide latitude for investigation of abstract scientific and philosophical matters, but is not in major degree intended to provide a similar latitude for passionate advocacy in realms like morals and politics where emotional factors must play a role. There is a certain kind of academic temperament which seems to hold that when professors and students descend into the forum or marketplace and state their beliefs strongly, they somehow forfeit rights to academic freedom. The implication is that pursuit of the truth must be confined to cloisters, laboratories, classrooms, and learned periodicals. I disagree fundamentally with this interpretation of academic freedom. If we limit it in any way, we are destroying it. In fact, the acid test of whether we actually believe in freedom is more frequently than not whether we tolerate it and encourage it in the practical concerns of men where feeling runs high and judgments are likely to be warmly expressed. In general, men do not become exercised emotionally about non-Euclidean geometry, for example, or Aristotelian and non-Aristotelian logic and the abstractions of modern theoretical physics. Issues of academic freedom don't arise here, but let sacred cows in the realms of politics and morals be attacked, and periodically they have to be attacked, and academic freedom often becomes precarious. It is in this sphere preeminently that it will be safeguarded or destroyed. D, it is alleged that students may be immature, in quotes. 
Answer, college is a place for bringing about maturity, and the only way to do this is to confront the students with a wide variety of views. In any event, in any event, in any, in any event, students are not infants and rightly resent being treated as infants. Now my last point, my last point, my last point is utilization of freedom. Finally, if academics claim far more rights to academic freedom as thus defined, they must use it in all areas. A limb unused tends to wither and the power it possesses to decline. So it is with freedom. If academics have convictions, they have an obligation to express them as forcefully as possible. Many German academic men were opposed to the rise of Hitler, for example, but for the sake of expediency or because they were fearful, failed to express themselves when they had the opportunity. Ultimately, their very right to express themselves was taken away, in part because they failed to use it. Unfortunately, academic men, like all men, sometimes fear the freedom which they claim. Like others, they must overcome this fear, and while the opportunity still exists, use the freedom they possess, even if it means criticizing institutions which many hold sacred are disturbing the even flow of comfortable lives. They may have to challenge the uniformities into which academic life often forces men. The uniform little boxes of Pete Seeger, for example. In order to preserve the very existence of true universities in the future. Now is the time to go into the box, and the first question is for Mr. Rosen. Uh, what are your qualifications for judging academic freedom? My qualifications are my belief in God and the belief in decency. I say I approve of academic freedom but there also should be academic responsibility. Here's a question uh, for both speakers. How many letters have you each received? What portion of your letters were favorable to your proposition? What number of crank type threatening letters and phone calls have you received? Uh, gentlemen? I'll be very happy to answer that question. I have received approximately 5,000 letters in favor of my stand. I have received approximately 12 letters. Four of them were not signed. I have received practically every night for several days, from one o'clock in the morning until six in the morning, numerous calls. And when my wife answers the phone, she's the boss at my house, they hang up. <laughs> very decent of them indeed. I don't know. I haven't counted the number of calls and letters. I would guess maybe 60 or 75 letters, 95% uh, of which are favorable, and uh, a good many phone calls, several of which were threatening, including a threat or two on life. Mr. Sibley, this question, Professor Sibley, this question is for you. Would you draw some comparisons between the restriction of free discussion in the Soviet Union and the restriction of discussion as advocated by Mr. Rosen? Uh, I, I, the, the point is made in the question itself, of course, that, that uh, I think any restriction on freedom of discussion is emulating what goes on or has gone on in the Soviet Union. And that's one reason I'm against it, because I don't like the sort of restriction that the Soviet Union has. Uh, the next question is for Mr. Rosen. In a recent speech, you labeled Mr. Sibley a pacifist. Just what is your objection to pacifism? Don't you believe in working for world peace? Uh, 
I'll answer that in this one statement. I don't like anybody or anything that is anti-American. Professor Sibley, the next question is for you. Can't you accomplish your objective of stimulating thinking through informing rather than advocating a system? I, I'm not, I didn't get that question, I'm sorry. Can't you accomplish your objective of stimulating thinking through informing rather than advocating a system? Uh, no. Uh, you can't. Uh, that, that, is, that is, I think that the truth about morals and politics, if there be a truth, and I think there is a truth to be discovered, as I said, can be discovered only by advocacy on many sides so that we can, uh, we can come to grips in the flesh, so to speak, with positions in this area, a very difficult area for discussion. Uh, we can inform, but inform at what level? Beyond a certain point, it's a, an information about simple so-called facts, but beyond that, uh, the views of the world, philosophies, attitudes, require more than simple, simply a catalog of facts. Uh, the social order is always being changed, and in morals and politics, we're always attempting to remedy its defects. How do we remedy them unless we propose remedies and argue for remedies and counter-argue for remedies? I take it that this question is for both speakers, since it is unlabeled. Is there a difference between defending the proposition that all ideas must have an opportunity be, to be heard and actually holding these ideas? Uh, may one, for example, advocate that pacifists should be allowed to express their views while not actually being a pacifist? Would you like to take the first crack at that, Mr. Rubin? I think any person has a right to express themselves any way they please. But when they come to expressing themselves as to nudity, free love, atheism, and so forth, I think they ought to hire a hall. I don't think they should use my university property that I'm a taxpayer and paying for. Would you like to uh, well, I would only, I would only uh, ask Professor Rosen, there's, there's a nudist association in Minnesota as far as I know. Are there nudists I know in Minnesota? I'm not one of them, but... Uh, 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 they pay taxes too. Shouldn't uh, should uh, suppose they suppose they send suppose they send uh, some of you may be children of nudists for all I know. And suppose you want to start an organization on the campus advocating and discussing nudism. Why shouldn't you have the right? You pay taxes. Your parents pay taxes. Uh, Mr. Rosen, do you still uh, hold the same feelings that you did in 1957 in your speech about the Negro situation in Birmingham? If so, why? If not, why not? I think that's a very fine question. I'm glad somebody asked it. I want to take, make this statement. The mayor of Birmingham, Alabama, Mr. James Morgan, was the commissioner of public works and a very dear friend of mine. I succeeded him as the national president of the American Public Works Congress. When Jim was elected mayor of Birmingham, he invited me down to that city. And I went down to the city for his installation, and he drove me all over the city. And I made this statement to him. I said, Jim, why don't you do something to help these poor people who are living in shacks and hovels? And he says, Milt, give me a chance. I've only been in here just one day. He says, you wait until you're, you're back here four years from now and see what happens. And I want to say my experiences on this first trip. I was dumbfounded to see the living conditions of the white trash. It was worse than any of the Negro conditions. I went back there in four years' time, and I saw what Mr. Morgan had done for these people. There were homes, the most beautiful homes you've ever seen, better than what we have up here for our people who are on relief. They had playgrounds, the finest playgrounds in the city. They had churches, the finest kind of churches. The improvements were excellent. And I complimented Mr. Morgan on it, and I said, why don't you come up north and tell us what you're doing for these unfortunate people down here? We, all we heard about in your, in your south was that you were kicking them off the streets, 
You were kicking them off the buses. No one knew what you were doing. And that statement seemed to hurt some people because I remarked upon the improvement of the Negro condition. Now, things aren't bad down in Birmingham. I've been there. I've seen Honeysuckle Circle. The cheapest home in the area is $25,000, and the best home is $150,000. All Negro. And the finest, cleanest section of Birmingham is Honeysuckle Circle. And I was very happy to see this improvement. My impression is simply this. I don't think any person should be deprived of an education because of the race, creed, or color. I know there are places in America where Jews haven't a chance. I know there's places in America where Catholics haven't a chance. I know there are places in America where other peoples, other races haven't a chance. It's an educational process to prove that a person is entitled to everything that's God-given without restrictions as to race, creed, or color. Here's a question for both speakers. That question is, how do you define responsibility, as stated in the question, what should be uh, the function and limits and responsibilities of academic freedom? Uh, would you like to speak first, Professor Sibley, and then Mr. Rosen? I think I touched on that, uh, that matter in my talk. Um, and it, I said, of course, that freedom and responsibility go together. The problem is, who enforces responsibility in matters of freedom of expression, freedom of discussion. And here I said, it seems to me you have a situation analogous to that of the press. Much of the press may be irresponsible in the way it uses its freedom. At least it's frequently accused of being irresponsible. Does that mean that therefore we advocate a government censorship over the press to enforce responsibility? No, I think most of us would reject that. Uh, the a way to attack it is to, uh, is to criticize the press for the way it uses its freedom. And if necessary, to try to get together enough money, if it's possible in this sort of a society, to organize a counter press. Uh, similarly with academic freedom, of course we're responsible. But no one has a right to judge me about how I use my freedom, except myself. Uh, again, saving by way of criticism of myself. They have no right to impose economic sanctions because of my particular view. No right to throw me bodily out of the university because someone differs with what I happen to say publicly. So long as I teach competently and I do not propagandize in my classes. The, the question... Uh, the the question is, how do you define responsibility? It's rather difficult to define responsibility with a person who has never had to meet a payroll. <laughs> Since 1915, I have had to meet a payroll. Not because I had a rich father or a rich uncle or a rich aunt. I had no one but myself. I made my way alone. And I've never failed to meet my obligations. I say there is a responsibility to every teacher on this campus to teach decency, honesty, to teach the preachings of the Bible, and I don't care whose Bible you take. <laughs> Maybe some of you ought to read the Bible once in a while. You might get acquainted with what, means, what it means to be decent and honest. Khrushchev has said, we cannot expect the Amer quote, we cannot expect the Americans to embrace communism, but we can assist their elected leaders in giving them small doses of socialism until one day they will awake and find they have communism. Please comment, Professor Sibley. I don't agree with him. I think he's wrong. And uh, I don't see why we should take communists at face value. I reject this view. Um, I, as I said, I'm not a member of the Communist Party and I don't hold to the Communist dialectic as stated by Mr. Khrushchev or uh, Mr. Lenin or Mr. Trotsky. Uh, I think that, uh, moreover, it's been proven that you can move in a socialist direction, uh, if, whatever this term may mean, I don't have time to define it, 
uh, may move in a socialist direction and be vigorously anti-communist. As a matter of fact, that's the lesson of European politics. The most vigorously anti-communist nations are the ones that have gone furthest in a socialist direction. Britain, for example. The Communist Party in Britain is minuscule. The Communist parties in, in, in Sweden and Denmark are very minor, and both those nations have gone far further in the direction of socialism, uh, more in the direction of socialism than we have. Uh, Willie Brandt, mayor of West Berlin, what's he, a socialist? And who would say that West Berlin is pro-communist? <laughs> The next question is for Ms. The next question is for Mr. Rosen, and uh, the person who wrote this one was sort of tricky because they got four questions on one sheet. Uh, Mr. Rosen, what is the purpose of a university? What is a socialist? What is a pacifist? And what is a communist? Get ready to laugh because I'm going to answer this as best I can. The purpose of the University of Minnesota or any other school of learning which is paid for out of tax money is to give you young men and women an opportunity of becoming su successful in this, the United States of America. What is a socialist? Well, there are so many definitions of socialism. I just heard Professor Sibley speak about Willie Brandt. Willie Brandt had to take the first thing that came along after they got rid of Nazism. Pacifist, I'd like to have the professor explain to me just what is a pacifist. I'd enjoy learning from a learned professor. What is the definition of a pacifist? You ask, what is a communist? I want to tell you folks. <laughs> you may laugh if you wish. My parents' family came from Rus Poland. They were all wiped out by the Communist Party. They were wiped out bodily, children, mothers and fathers, my family, my blood. They're all gone. What are communists? They are the filth of the world. And I don't care who knows it. That's my statement. Uh, would you like to respond and define these terms? Uh, was it directed to me or? Well, either speaker may, if you would like to. Well, just a very brief, a very brief comment then. Uh, purposes of the university. Is yes. Well, I think I stated the purposes of the university in my talk. Uh, I hope I did. What is a socialist? Uh, I think Mr. Rosen is right in saying the, the term has been used very widely, uh, in varying ways. Um, I would define it as uh, democracy for an industrial order. This is the, my definition of socialism, the extension of democracy into all areas of life. This is very brief and inadequate, but I have to be brief. What is a pacifist? A pacifist is one who rejects the use of violence for the achievement of good ends under all circumstances and thinks that violence and war uh, cannot accomplish the general good of mankind. Uh, what is a communist? Um, as generally used today, although this again has a wide variety of meanings, a communist is one who follows the line formulated in Moscow or Pekin, I'm never quite sure, about the world. Would you like to stay up because the next question is for you, Professor Sibley. Would you like to see a man with Mr. Rosen's views on the faculty of the University of Minnesota? <laughs> Certainly. Uh, if, I mean, if, if he were appointed in a department after... Uh, uh, after investigation of his academic qualities, for example, his academic qualifications. I'm serious about this. I, would I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't object at all. I would welcome, for example, an occasional birchite, uh, uh, or what have you, uh, let's say, in, uh, in the engineering department. I'd like to see this one. I, I just happen to pick out engineering. I didn't mean that, uh, but, but, but in any department. Uh, provided, provided, again, A, that the individual is competent, as judged by his colleagues, B, that he doesn't propagandize in the classroom, C, that he's willing to state his position publicly and to be criticized for his position. Now, these are, these are qualifications, I think, for any academic. And with these qualifications, of course, I would recommend, I, I would accept anyone uh, uh, such as Mr. Rosen uh, with views like those of Mr. Rosen. The next question for Mr. Rosen is if 
we are to fight communism, how can we do it without learning about it first? Well, I don't know how you're going to fight communism when the request of the pastors is that we should drop our arms, that we should get rid of our army, our navy, our air force, and so forth. We should become destitute as far as prevention of, of uh, cruelty to people throughout the world is concerned. I can only say this. I don't profess to be qualified to become a professor. I've never made that statement. I'll argue about tires with anybody in this room. I don't want anyone to change their mind because of me, but I want decent people to follow decent advice and counsel, and I think I'm qualified to give them that advice and counsel because I have a God-fearing home, and I have a home that is church-wise, and I love it. Mr. S Professor Sibley, where is academic freedom's two-way street when a student is distracted from pursuing his course by attacks on his cultural and religious background and his Christian morality. Uh, I don't know exactly what this means. Uh, in any large institution, I assume that there will, there will be a wide variety of points of view. I would hope that there would be. The Board of Regents statement suggests this also. Uh, I think that part of the job of growing up and reaching maturity is being able to concentrate on one's immediate tasks even though one doesn't like everything that's being said in the world. But one doesn't try to shut up those who are saying it. The next question is, would Mr. Rosen please define academic freedom limiting himself to the topic? I think the gentleman has explained academic freedom in his one question. He has a right to ask me questions, I have a right to answer them. I don't think academic freedom permits any professor to recommend nudity at the University of Minnesota. I don't think any academ academic freedom should permit the teaching of atheism in a school which I am paying taxes for. And that's my enunciation of academic freedom. Could I, could I comment briefly? Uh, again, I simply come back to the point, uh, there must be atheists in Minnesota. I know there are. I've heard of them. <laughs> They've had children going to this university. They pay taxes too. Now, by what right? Do those who are not atheists tell atheists that they can't discuss atheism on the campus or start an atheist club? Mr. Sibley, Professor Sibley, in accordance with what you have said, do you think we have allowed enough freedom of the conservative point of view without jeers and hissing and refusing to listen to a philosophy which differs markedly from that of the majority of college students. Uh, yeah, in some respects, yes. I think that in some institutions there has been in the past a kind of totalitarian liberal, if I may call it this. This is Norman Thomas's expression of a number of years ago. And totalitarian liberalism some kinds, sometimes can be very, very intolerant and very unreceptive to diverse points of view. I'm as much against this sort of attitude as I'm against totalitarian conservatism, so-called. Mr. Rosen, are you against complete freedom of speech in the classroom? And two, are you afraid that college students are not able to choose the best way of life for themselves if confronted with diverse ethics and opposing beliefs? I'm not opposed to free speech anywhere. I, as I said when I spoke before, I practiced in my work as a member of the city council. I just want to say this to the students. I enjoy your laughs. I enjoy your hissing, perhaps. That's your prerogative, but I want to say that you've been very, very decent so far, and I appreciate it. I do not, I do not prevent 
it would recommend that we prevent any person from expressing themselves if their expressions are decent and clean. Now, you may laugh at that statement. You may laugh at it. But I've seen some of the stuff you kids have been reading. <laughs> and if that's the kind of filth you want, I don't believe in paying taxes to give it to you. Uh, this is a question for Professor Sibley. Uh, the apologists in your behalf are making the statement that the proposals contained in your letter to the Minnesota Daily have been advanced by you strictly for the purpose of argument to uphold academic freedom and not that you yourself subscribe to the proposals. Is that so? Yes, in general, it's so. I, uh, although I'm very much a critic of automation, the way it's being introduced, uh, in, but in, in general, I'm not a nudist, I'm not a communist. I've said this twice or two or three times already. Uh, I don't advocate the overthrow of any government by force and violence, including the Russian and the Chinese. I repeat that, as well as the American. I don't think any of them should be overthrown by force and violence. Now, this is a very minority point of view, of course because we're usually selective. We, we think that we want to overthrow some governments by force and violence, but not others. I'm against overthrowing any government by force and violence. I don't know what that makes me, whatever label we want to attack. But in general, I simply suggested these organizations because I know in American society there are many people who subscribe to these beliefs in, the, in the, these organizations that I listed are invented. One or two of them I invented. Uh, <laughs> And my point is, it's better for these views to come out into the open where we can grapple with them than remain subterranean and suppressed, you see. Commissioner Rosen, you've done a fine job of listing those views and activities of Professor Sibley which you find objectionable. What do those views and activities have to do with Professor Sibley's fitness to be a professor at the university? Is not any attempt to judge a professor's ability to teach because of his views and activities thought control? I don't want to delve in hearsay conversation, but I have had reports from mothers who've told, who have told me of their children who have attended Professor Sibley's classes and have come home with stories of books that they have been told to read they were filled with filth. If that's the kind of studies you want, you may have them. I have no control over you youngsters. But I want to say this. Something you want, little girl? <laughs> I may not set well with you youngsters in the audience for what I'm about to say. But I'm going to say it to you. I am a Jew of Orthodox Jewish parents. My home has been a God-loving home. We fear filth in my home and in my religion. And I believe in cleanliness. And if that be treason, you make the most of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. I would like to thank both speakers for the manner in which they have carried forth this discussion of what should be the nature and limits of academic freedom. Thank you very much.